How's it going everyone? My name is Mr. Boss with the Win, and I have a really special video today, but I also have a guest with me. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell the audience what you're doing here and uh, how you're getting on the show. Hey everyone, it's Justin, aka Spike. I was a part of the Controller Model of Honor Warfighter on Fireteam Red. Awesome. So I'm going to be doing an interview with uh, Justin or Spike Mouth, mainly because I was really interested in the show, you know, the, all the aspects. And we're going to try to talk about a little bit of the stuff that you guys didn't get to see on camera through the 12 or 13 episodes. So we're going to start asking some questions right now. And the first one is, I want to talk about the recruitment process. You know, how did you get on this, you know, pseudo reality show? And, you know, like what was the process of you getting out to L.A. and wherever else you had to go? All right, so it started, let me think back. I think it was in August when I saw a couple of friends, like I know Mrs. Violent, D squared from the first season, and they tweeted out that Funim and Murray Productions, who created the real world of challenges in the first season of the controller, they were holding auditions for the second season. So I just like thought about it. I was like, you know what, what the hell? Like I'll just put my name in there and see what happens. So I put my name in there, you know, submit some pictures, the application, all that stuff. And then they got back to me a few hours later and it was like, hey, fill out the figure application. I was like, all right, so I filled out all that stuff. And then it was just like a slow, steady process for the next week and a half, two weeks of just filling out different types of paperwork. And, you know, they didn't really tell us or tell me at least how I was doing in the audition process. They're like, oh, yeah, it was great, all that stuff. Um, so I was just hoping and praying that I was going to get on, you know, it looked good. And then all of a sudden I got the phone call one day and they're like, hey, by the way, you've been chosen as one of the gamers on the controller. I was like, oh, no shit, that was awesome. That's a pretty sweet phone call right there. Oh, it definitely was. Like, you know, it's, I, for reality TV, like, I didn't think I was ever going to do it. So I was just like, well, yeah, whatever. Like, I'll put my name in. I'm not worried about it if I don't get it. So, but hearing that I got it, I was like, oh, shit. Like, I'm super excited. And um, if, you, if you don't mind, what were you doing at the time? You know, or were you going to school or were you working? Like, how do you, like, tell your friends or your family or your coworkers, like, hey, I'm going on a reality show for a certain amount of time? So basically... I'm a professional gaming coach for Fnatic's Halo Reach team. Um, and at the time, Halo Reach had already stopped holding events. So MLG stopped holding events, all that stuff. So at that point, I did more sales management work for Fnatic. And I was going to like E3. I you know, was going to all these different events to promote Fnatic. Also talk to companies about sponsors and stuff like that. And then, so at that time, I wasn't really doing much. Um, I think I was just hanging out at home, gaming, you know, getting ready for Halo 4. And that's when I just decided to put my name in there. Awesome. That's uh, that's pretty cool. So the second question I want to talk about is, you know, talk a little bit about the fire teams, maybe more in depth with, you know, the people you got to meet. So uh, the blue, red, green, and yellow, you know, just any information you can give, funny stories, anything along that lines would be awesome. Well, it started when I went to the airport. Uh, I live outside of Boston, so I get a flight out of Logan Airport and I flew down to Georgia and I met up with all the people and I just sat in the airport for a while. Come to find out, Faze Temper on Yellow Team happened to live, I don't know, 10 minutes away from me. I didn't even know who he was. Never heard of Faze Clan before, before that. And we were we started talking when we got there. He was like, oh yeah, I just caught a flight from Boston. I was like, wait a minute. I was just on that flight. Where'd you come from? <laughs> He's like, oh, I live in Haverhill. I was like, oh, I live 10 minutes from you. So... It was, it was pretty cool. Um, other than that, you know, I got to meet a lot of different people that I wouldn't normally meet because I'm not a part of the Call of Duty esports scene. So I got to meet Optic Hex, owner of Optic Gaming and Neon. That was amazing, you know, to see, you know, where he comes from and what his background's like. Um, on top of that, x you know, he doesn't compete, but he has a big following on YouTube for Call of Duty. Um, it was great to see how he got started and all that stuff. And on top of that, like, you know, meeting Paintball Kitty, FPS Russia... Syndicate and Spy Fox, all with different types of backgrounds and all really known on YouTube. And I didn't know any of these people going into the show. Like, I, you know, as bad as it sounds, I didn't even know who FPS Russia was when I showed up. I, um, I've, I've had the pleasure to meet FPS Russia once. And can you confirm he's a really nice guy, but he's kind of got a thick, like, like, uh, shell to crack into? He looks really intimidating, but like, if the more you get to know him, the nicer he is. Is that kind of a true statement? Yeah, I think the intimidating part comes with the fact that every time you see him, he's practically got some sort of a gun in his hand. <laughs> uh, so standing up against a Russian with a gun, pretty intimidating, I'd say. 
but after a while, like, you know, it, it was really cool hanging out with him. He's really funny to get to know. Like, he's just such a hilarious person. And, you know, hanging out with him on set, off set. You know, we all went to Applebee's, and it was just awesome to see, like, what he was like in person. And Yeah, you guys went to dinner every night? <laughs> well, uh, almost every night. It was kind of like being, like, stuck in a hotel and waiting, you know, to see if we could now, get a did, ride. Did you guys, uh, did you guys live in Georgia, or when uh, you were in Georgia to film the uh, the shooting part? Did you stay in like a hotel, anything along those lines? Yeah, we stayed in a hotel close by. I can't really give the exact location of yeah, yeah, FDS no worries. Russia's compound, but we did stay in a hotel close by, and uh, it's pretty cool. It was just like a regular, you know, Holiday Inn type hotel, um, and they really hooked us up there, so. And then every so often we'd go see FPS Russia. And there was a gun range close by, and I think x actually went and filmed a couple of videos. So that was on his I YouTube. I saw those. Yeah, I saw yeah. a few of those. So, I mean, it was pretty cool to see what it was like being FPS Russia and see what it was like where he lived. So um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the military people. You know, they introduced themselves in the beginning of the show, you know, what they did, Army Rangers or where they were on other shows. But, you know, what were some of their personalities like? Uh, you know... <laughs> They acted like, you know, it's it cool because they're military guys, and I thought they were going to be, like, you know, hard asses on us. They're very intimidating. Yeah. But they were so funny to be around. Like, we were cracking jokes all the time. And they gave us these little camcorders to record, like, behind-the-scenes stuff. And I don't think anybody's ever going to see that because of how inappropriate it ended up being. <laughs> There's no way anybody's ever going to see that footage. Like, it got so crazy. And it, it's weird because, you know, you had eight guys together, no girls. And it, it got really interesting. <laughs> a lot of guy talk going <laughs> a on. A lot but... of guy talk going on. But it was hilarious being around all these guys, like seeing where everyone came from, what their background was like, especially the military guys. Because, you know, my teammate, John, he was a reconnaissance Marine sniper. And to know the fact that he was like, oh, yeah, I used to camp out at this one location and wait there for days until they told me to take a shot. Like, I don't think I could ever do that. Like, I could never sit there and try. It's to... a high stress job right there. Yeah couldn't do it i'll just stick to the video game so. and uh so a lot of people were interested some of the behind the scenes you know aspect of the show fps russia uploaded a video where he kind of showed a little bit of behind the scenes but i want to get it from someone who was actually there so on the actual youtube videos you know it's really high paced it's one contestant goes they kind of do the interview where they talk about what they did another contestant goes what was the shooting like because you know Blowing up pieces of wood and shrapnel don't just disappear, and new targets don't just appear instantly. It's not a video game. So how did that go, like shooting, setting up, everything along those lines? Well, each day for the shooting portion took about, I'd say, 12 to 14 hours. Rather, It's be, a long day. Yeah, it's like filming scenes for the intro, filming each team shoot, setting up each station, and it was just insane. So it was, there was a lot of sitting around for us. But, I mean, they really took care of us with, like, food and everything. So we had really nothing to worry about except for just hang out, joke around, do whatever we wanted in the little area. So it, it took a long time, and it got very tiring, but it was well worth it in the end. So, like, you'd see one shooting challenge, and but that would be awesome, and then you'd wait, like, you know, sometimes a couple hours until the next team comes up. So it was a lot of fun either way. And that's got to be tough because when the first person goes, I mean... Like, like I said, in the video, it was like back to back to back to back. You all know, like, okay, green team did good here or, you know, blue team did bad here. But in sometimes teams could be waiting two to three hours before they know the results of what they're going to get to do. That's that's crazy, in my opinion. Well, yeah, on top of that, like, we didn't, they didn't tell us any time. So whatever challenges went by in the shooting challenge, we didn't know any time. So we were just kind of guessing if we were winning, second, third, fourth, whatever it may be. We had a good estimate but we still didn't know for sure. Um, now, now I, oh, you go ahead, sorry. No, like I said, it was just, we didn't know anything until the very end, practically. Now, I have to know, when in all the videos when Sark or someone goes like, oh, look at the results, were you guys actually seeing a highlight reel of what was going on? Because in the videos, they always showed like a highlight reel, like who was in, who did bad or who was in first or whatnot, so I don't know. Yeah, well, we didn't get to see the highlight reel. It was basically because, I mean, they wanted to edit this perfectly, and it looked amazing, the final product. So they would just pretend like they were showing it, but they would show the scores. That We actually saw what the scores were like, so those impressions were legit. Real? Yeah, th okay. they were legit. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. That's what I was wondering, if those were real or not. So anyways, that's really cool. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure they dumbed down, like, for instance, 
the finale when going into the gaming portion. Like, I thought my team won because, I mean, I grabbed all those flags and I only dropped one. And then, you know, John did really well shooting those targets. So I, I thought for sure that we won. And to see that we lost by, like, so much time, I was like, how is that even possible? 